Seven o'clock here on 88.3 Southern FM, the sounds of Bayside. Thursday evening, 7pm, it's time for Right Now, Right Now, and indeed it is. It's Gaetana here, and welcome, listeners. Now, But first, Beth Spencer, welcome to Right Now. Hi, great to be here. Well, it's lovely to be speaking with you. Now, listeners, you might remember um, Shaping the Fractured Self from... Uh, very recently, uh, a collection of poems and also prose pieces that go for, with each um, set of poems from each poet, editor Heather Taylor-Johnson, and of course, Beth has a section in there. And that's and because Beth contacted me after the interview with Heather, um, that's how we've ended up having Beth on the program. And it's just lovely, Beth. And, oh, thank you. <laughs> and thank you for sending me your ebook of Vagabondage. Now, that was 2014 that was published, is that right? Yes, it's, um, it's, like it's a print book as well from yes, University yes. of Western Australian Press, and yes. there's an ebook version as well. Yeah. Exactly. And Vagabondage, listeners, is a verse memoir of Beth travelling around, living in her camper van for the year 2009 10, is that right? Yeah, when I turned, that's after I turned 50. You didn't have to tell us your age. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> that was one of those sort of weird, wild things you do when you sort of get to that point in your life. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's an interesting, you've got in the book, you've got, um, and we must mention that besides the various sections, there are seven sections, listeners, but besides that, there are fabulous photographs by Beth as well that sort of a part of it, sort of a commentary, um, complementary to the verse, just fabulous. Now, you're, you do talk about very early on about sort of dismantling things and having to mm. leave your 10-year sanctuary and refuge with a whisper yeah. of butterflies inside and um, to the world, please make room, I plan to leave no trace, which is very interesting. That well, the Leave No Trace is, is kind of like the mantra or the, the motto of the um, free camping uh-huh. movement. Mm-hmm. So the idea is that when you go, you know, you, you, you just rock up in your camper van or your motorhome or whatever, mm-hmm. and the idea is that after you're gone, there should be no trace. So yes. I thought that was kind of, yeah, when you're in this sort of writing a book but also wanting to kind of almost erase your steps as you go, mm-hmm. like not making something mm-hmm. yeah. that is... That you get stuck in the story, you know what I mean? And mm. poetry just seemed a really great way of doing that because um, you can have all that space in between it and kind of contradict yourself and all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a motif as well as numerous others. I think the, the dismantling thing because, um, mm. you know, it is there a, a great deal that keeps recurring. And while um, vagabondage in, in one sense is part of that literature of life on the road, it seems to me that it's so much more about your inner life, isn't it really? Yes, it was very much an inner journey rather than a... Mm. People sort of go, oh, you were so lucky, you know, I've always wanted to travel around, and they, <laughs> they always refer to it as when I travelled around Australia, and I think, yeah, not exactly, because yeah. <laughs> it, it actually was my house. The, the story, yeah. as you know from reading it, is yes. that um, when I sold my house, the prices had gone through the roof, and I actually couldn't afford... I sold a house in the country, and I couldn't afford to buy anything after that, so that's, so it was, it was really necessity as much as anything, and... I think there's a great deal of difference between travelling when you can suddenly go home again. Yes. And travelling when you can't. <laughs> that's it. You know, anything that happens, that's where you are. And it was a very strange, list- dislocated year. Not only had I sort of, as I say, the house really was my sanctuary. It was the first ever yeah. house I owned. Yeah. And um, it, to leave it was, was huge. And then to get rid of so much of my stuff. And then I'm sort of... At the same time, like I'd always kind of been a writer, and but my health, as you'll know from yes. the fractured self, yes. um, it just got to the point where it was just crippling me, really. And I, so I actually gave up writing. It took me a long time to sort of feel comfortable saying that. And so when I was in the van, I didn't have a job. <laughs> you know, I didn't even call myself a writer anymore. No. Um, I didn't have a family. I didn't have a children. I didn't have a husband. I didn't have a house. I didn't yeah. have any of those kind of normal markers that 
we define ourselves by. Yes. Especially when you've got to 50, you know. Yeah. And, um, and here I am, and basically I was just reconnecting with an awful lot of people um, and going and visiting them. And so I'd sort of turn up with, you know, like a snap on the shell. Everything's in this van. Yeah. And, and everything's just me. I'm, I'm it, you know. Yeah. And, um, and turn up, and they've got kids, and they've got houses, you know, great houses and fantastic relationships and terrific jobs and all this kind of stuff. And it was, it was, it was really weird. It was a very strange year. Yes. Would you like me to read one of the poems? Because when I came to write this, I was sort of thinking, well, how can I tell this story in fragments, basically? And I, I, I thought I had an idea of where it would start that, you know, when I sold the yeah. house. Yeah. And I had this idea of where it would end, this... Um, I might read that one towards the end. I, I didn't of, know whether we should read that or not. Because I know, I, I never know whether to read it or not. Yeah, it's like sort of, doing a spoiler. I found that. Yeah, okay, movie. good. I I'm glad you said that. I won't movie. in that case. Yeah, so there yeah. was this moment, uh, you know, that I knew was kind yeah. of captured something about the ending for me. Yeah. And um, and then trying to sort of piece it together. And um, I mean, one, one, one night I sort of woke up in the middle of the night and I um, I just wrote... I, well, I spoke into my iPhone, like put the recorder uh-huh. on the iPhone, and just spoke um, a long one from the middle called Reasons to Leave, which I can barely even read again because it's so personal yes. and so raw. Yes, uh, and that's the word I wanted to use about some of it. Yeah. Very raw. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was just spoken into the phone. You know, it was edited and, and yeah. revised later on, mm. but it was basically just spoken into the phone at three in the morning. And I kind of thought, that's the centre of the book. That's uh-huh. kind of like that raw, beating heart of yes, the book. Yes, yes. And to, in order to write it, I had to tell myself no one would read it. Ah. And I kept on tricking myself that, you know, who reads poetry? I'll just write a little book of poetry and, you know, it'll just help me to make sense of this again and maybe ease back into writing. It was it was my rehab project. Well, you know, this um, in that third section, I think, Being Not, and the poem, yeah. Giving Yourself permission not to be a writer I thought yeah. that must have been a huge wrench I, I mean we can tell that, that it's a huge wrench having to sell the home etc and give away so much but that seems to be such a the writing and being a writer is such a core part of the identity of self yeah. the sense of self that I thought um yeah that's a huge step to make but of course as you say in the shipwreck coast, which is in both vagabondage and shaping the fractured self, um, you kind of needed to be able to let yourself off the hook because um, when you were so ill, then that time when you that was a, probably the first time you'd packed up and you'd come down mm. to that little cottage by the sea in Victoria. You it thought sounds so idyllic. <laughs> it does, and I mean, you thought you thought that this was a chance to get well, to recover, yeah. to write, and um, it's it's a, a fabulous and powerful, powerful poem. And there again, on the in the first few stanzas, you say, "And I had to dismantle my life," but hey, it was already mm-hmm. crumbling. Um, and as I've pointed out before, when I was talking with Heather about shaping the fractured self etc I, I was deeply moved bec- when you say at one stage I feel an enormous sadness for that 30 year old who thought rest meant going off alone with a typewriter and a few reams of paper feeling weak and vulnerable try something harsh and, harsh and challenging that'll do it and of course it's that it's that sense of the the older you looking back and grieving for the innocence of that young woman thinking that, that yeah. somehow it would all get sorted and yeah, I just thought it would be a few months, you yeah. know, like it would, if someone had to tell me, you're going to have you going through this for 28 years, <laughs> you know, I don't know what I would have thought. It was, it's, um, it, and, and it was, that's why I, I sent you the email because yes. I was moved that you, you actually picked up on the grief because I think that's oh. something that's missing. You know, a lot of people don't realise with the chronic illness, there is so much grief oh, about yes. sort of what you, you know, could have been, what could have happened yes. and stuff. And, and so, yes, it's sort of... Well, it's a huge um, thing, isn't it? It's for, it's for what so much that might have been and mm. so much that uh, so many limitations. I mean, we all will have limitations, but it is so very frustrating when one can't think well, work well, r- do what is sort of central to one's being. It's it's exactly. bad enough being yeah. sick, but when you can't write as well, <laughs> it's just terrible. When it's, when it's your, yeah, they're the core things. And, yeah. For, uh, yeah. you know, for a lot of people can manage to sort of still hold on to those, 
basics of a life, family, partner, yeah. kids, that kind of thing. And I think they can fit back into it when they sort of start getting well again. Whereas I had um, been a kind of a relinquisher right from the start. Oh, like yes, if I, In order to write, I would relinquish things. And mm-hmm. it probably was a mistake because you relinquish so much that you kind of then end up so much energy goes just in trying to hold yourself together. So, yeah, that was, that was an interesting time. Um, the, I, I did keep writing through most mm-hmm. of the time, but it was more sort of um, after How to Conceive of a Girl, which, like, so my first book was poetry, then the next one was fiction, mm-hmm. and then there was this really long gap of almost 20 years, mm-hmm. and I basically bit off more than I could chew with a, a novel, which I may come back to one day, mm-hmm. but it was, I couldn't write for more than about, um, you know, a, a few hours, if I wrote for an hour, I'd be like in bed for three days with pain and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I knew something wasn't kind of you know, right there. Yeah. So I don't know if you know um, a, a technique called EFT, emotional freedom technique. The, you tap on the acro- yes, yes. Yeah, tap on. I did that for eight months before I could feel comfortable saying I may never finish this book without feeling sick in the stomach. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, yes, it was a big deal to... Um, to make that choice, but it also, it you know, it, it, I needed to, and it was great then coming back to Vagabondage, creating, and also like after you've had one or two books, it's hard to write without thinking the world's looking over your shoulder, mm-hmm. and you've really got to prove yourself, mm-hmm. and then when you take 18 years of one book, it's got to be a fantastic <laughs> book, so there's all this, you know what I mean, there's this terrible pressure, pressure. that you put on mm-hmm. yourself, yes, massive yes, self-pressure, yes, yes. so I just basically had to take that self-pressure off, yes. and so with Vagabondage, I'd say, just for me, just, you know, if I'm not in it, yeah. one, and just keep sort of, whenever I'd sort of start seeing how the themes were emerging in it, and how it was starting yes. to get the structure, I'd sort of think, oh, this actually could be something, oh, and yeah. then I'd get pain again, <laughs> mm-hmm. so I'd have to sort of, you know, do things to sort of just basically keep tricking myself to create that little private space where I yeah. could expose myself, where I could really explore things, where I could, you know, go deep into stuff. Well, you know, this goes back to, and I've got I've got four pages of handwritten notes on the book because being an ebook, <laughs> I haven't got it with me, you see. I've also got uh, my, my running sheet with my uh, areas I want to talk about with you. And of course, this to me is one of the recurrent themes that's that comes out of the the poems and yeah. uh, the rising, sinking, etc., that you talk mm. about, um, and also the casting the self adrift. This is something that you've done uh, numerous times as well, it seems, in your life. And um, it's almost like trying to reinvent yourself yes, and start again. Yes. Yeah. But it's really because, coming back to what I was saying earlier, this inner journey is really, um, for this year in the van, it really is the. A turning point and I guess a significant time because you need to confront certain things yeah. from past and present and really deal with them because they are at the core as well as the pain and physical illness but they are at the core of certain difficulties it seems to me that that impact your life and even probably your writing even though you may draw on them for the writing I think they are significant and there's a number of other little themes that I noticed coming through that really struck me and though I love your wicked sense of humor and your playfulness at times and also the fabulous photographs and other things and a beautiful use of recurring metaphors and images and things all the time as I read this I just felt the pain underneath and a certain grieving, and there's a, there's a, yes, there's, it's not only purposely casting adrift, there's a feeling of being adrift and not necessarily wanting to be adrift, wanting to be able to I have think, that anchor, you know? Yeah, I think, like, I think that's why poetry works so well. At one stage I thought, maybe I should turn this into prose, you know, get no. bigger readership, no. and it was just like, no, it just needs to be in this sort of fragmented way. Yeah. Because it's it is that contradictoriness of it um, that it was that in a way when I think about things like the, the poem "Reasons to Leave," it's like when I I have to admit to myself, in a way, I've set my life up that I can leave easily. Yeah. Well, you do, and mm, so in a way yes, that can, yeah. you know, you end up with a lot of pain and loneliness and grief yeah. and all that kind of yeah. stuff. But it's also exhilarating to be able to do that yes. and to keep reinventing yourself and yeah. and taking yourself out of um, situations. So, in a lot of people's eyes, I was living the dream, you know, and they they sort of felt themselves saddled with children and job and house and <gasps> oh, to be able to throw it all off. And I kind of thought, you better, you know, just be careful, you know, what you wish yes, for, kind exactly. of thing. Yes, exactly. Yes. Do you want to read? But I thought that maybe point. if I read, yes, if I read. Yeah, I'll read um, Freefall, because okay. when I was um, mm-hmm. um, 
when I was, it took me quite a while to sell the house and so I had a lot of time to sort of dismantle and work mm-hmm. out what to keep, what to take, what to let go of. And, um, and when I came to sort of write this, I was thinking, how can I capture that strange feeling oh, of yeah. terror? Because I would yeah. wake up in the middle of the night just with waves of terror yes, going through me, yes, like, what am yes. I doing, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. And not only going in a van, but I'm, I'm not well <laughs> yeah. going into a van, you know? <laughs> I've got no backstop, you know? And, um, but at the same time, it was quite exciting, you know, this kind of, mm. wow, what's going to happen? So I'll read this yeah, um, free, free fall, yes. and in brackets, trust. Mm. In between packing, cleaning, sorting, and scouring the web for a van, I became obsessed with videos of people jumping out of planes. Two favourites. One, a woman screaming non-stop in the plane, but blood-curdling screams as she's <laughs> methodically connected up to her instructor buddy. Manic screams as her buddy frog-marches her to the open door. Blue murder as he firmly and persistently prizes her fingers off the door frame, like a banshee as, she sh- as he shoves them both out into nothingness. No foothold, no grasp, then the air catching, holding her. The world, just an idea, just a thought. Laughing as her feet touch the ground and the parachute rolls like a magnificent wave behind her, saying, oh, do it again. (laughs) And two, the 90-year-old, whose false teeth fly out and are whooshed away when she opens her mouth in delight. Yes, I love it. They're, 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 it's brilliant. And I'm going to go back to what you said before about how it can be exhilarating to be free and, and what have you to travel on. And yet uh, for Heat Wave on page 106, mm. you say, all I want is a house, a desk, running water, and I think also you want to feel at home, as though you can put down roots, as though you do belong. And that goes back yeah. to that goes back to what I see as – Two really significant poems, The Party of My Life, that looking back there to your 25th birthday, that was a very Uh interesting... The Party of Life, yep. Party of, yeah, my life, yep. And um, Cubby House on Wheels and um, Never Having a Sort of permanent sort of place, etc., as well as... Emotionally, show. yeah, yeah, kind of sort of, because exactly. I did have a permanent place. <laughs> yeah. But that kind of, yes, it certainly goes back to childhood. Yeah. Um, I was the youngest of six yes. and um, very kind of imaginative child in a family that didn't read. Ah, you know, yes. no books, <laughs> sort uh-huh. of thing. And also that kind of stuff is not work, so it wasn't sort of, you know, valued. So I think there was sort of um, that sense of dislocation from yeah. very early age. Yeah. And um, I've sort of carried that through in a lot yes, of ways. Yes. Yeah. And that's why, and also the shipwreck coast too. For I think so many things there. Of you go, when you're looking back at what you you did then when you were thirty and how you were trying to deal with things and the impacts that I think is significant because again, very often you are looking at those, looking back at things and processing. And a, a wonderful, wonderful moment that I loved um, was. Show and tell to in, on page eighty eight, giving a lift to this person, and you say it's so poignant. I just love it. He draws me out until a picture emerges, all my many achievements, many of which I'd considered failures. In yeah. the warm, slow breath of his regard, I come alive, and I think that is such an important moment and element, whether it's real or not. I just think that that realization and that. No, nourishment from a stranger that gives mm. you a different perspective on self is so important. It is. When you spend a lot of time basically just lying on your back, staring at the ceiling, you mm-hmm. sort of feel so useless. Mm-hmm. And so to see yourself in somebody else's eyes yes. who doesn't see the, all the lack of things that, mm-hmm. you know... And like from my family background too, um, as I say, books weren't important, but having children was, mm-hmm. you know, and marriage and all that kind of mm-hmm. sort of stuff. So I think it's sort of, a lot of it was sort of seeing my life. Um, there's a quote from Foucault at the, in, in one of the epigraphs I chose. Mm-hmm. He says, um, mm-hmm. why can't a person's life be a work of art? You know, yes, a lampshade exactly. can. And, mm. and so a lot of it was to seeing, looking at ways of seeing my life as, having a sense of belonging and having a sense of meaning, even though it seems so crazy and chaotic and, and um, I was just, I was focusing. It's, it's, it's like in a way when I had the garden at um, Creswick and near Ballarat, mm-hmm. I had a house there mm-hmm. and um, people would come and see my garden and they would just go, oh my God, because, you know, I built this garden up over 
10 years. It was mm-hmm. um, an old garden that I kind of renovated that yes. had gone to gone to weeds and seed and um and they would just see how they would just be in awe and say how amazing it was and i'd walk out the door and i'd just see the weeds and the things that i hadn't done yet (laughs) so i think you can get into that terribly negative you know sort of Mm. just seeing that it was so it was very necessary for me to go out from there and go out into the world and start getting that sort of feedback from people and seeing myself and it is so very much the whole book is is search for home and belonging and yes and um and Where you belong, finding, yeah. And, and in a way, sort of like writing this book too is finding my voice again. Yes. So, and that is yes. where I belong. That is, oh, that is yeah. sort of like home for me. Yes. And, and it was this strange thing that the more I wrote it just for me, the bizarre thing was how many people connect with it. Yes. <laughs> and even though, you know, people, I've had people who have got the kids and the home, you know, the partner and the job and all that kind of thing, oh, you're writing about my life. <laughs> and I think this is crazy. But so I think inside of us all, you know what I mean? We're still all yeah. alone inside our own skin. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so inside of us all is this kind of, like, um, How to Conceive of a Girl is very much being about being a single woman. The, mm-hmm. the stories in that sort of yeah. uh, um, uh, look at this being on the outer in that way. And it's amazing, again, the people that connect with that because inside of all of us is still, this, you know, the single woman. The, the, and I think this sort of search for home is a very fundamental oh, thing. Yes. And often you can be... Within a relate, you know, some of the loneliest times in my life have been when I've been in a relationship. Yeah. Yep. And I'm going to go back to another thing that I love too. There's a moment on page 120, Small World, and watching um, a coach and a sporting game, and you've got your laptop, and through the laptop and the computer, your coach, we dig into the past to bring me into the present. And I think, again, that's one of those themes, isn't it, again, of that having to deal with and the rising and sinking. But, um, the final poem brings it so beautifully together. We won't do a spoiler, listeners. You've just got to buy <laughs> Beth Spencer's Vagabondage, either by the book or the e-book. Tell them, um, give them your website, uh, Beth, and how they can get the book or e-book, please. Okay, so my website is just bethspencer.com, mm-hmm. and um, you can go there, and there's a PayPal, you know, you can buy the book through PayPal or send me a message if you want to do direct deposit. You could probably order it in at your bookshop. Mm-hmm. Probably not on the shelves anymore, but you could certainly ask them to get it. Or you can go straight to the publisher, which is UWAP. Mm-hmm. I think it's .com.au. Mm-hmm. And uh, the other thing too is libraries, you know. I mean, if yeah. it's not in your library, get them to order it in. Um, because at all borrow the book out because even that can if you can't afford to buy books that helps the author because with a book like this i'm an s so i'm usually on the bottom shelf you know spencer <laughs> <laughs> and then it's in the poetry section which most people don't, don't even go yeah, near know, don't I even know. realize that yeah, exists yeah. so if the book doesn't get borrowed out they throw the book out good point. so you know oh, that's a good point, go yeah. to your library okay. borrow it out talk yeah. to your librarian about it get yeah. them to put it up on the you know face out somewhere yeah. And uh, I just think it's interesting because a lot of people think, oh, I don't really like poetry. But if, you know, when I've, a lot, most people tell me they just read it in one go all the oh, way yeah. through. You so can, you can. Yes, look, you can. And I think, listeners, I think you will find so much in there as there's so much in terms of the the, the words, the, the verse, the poems themselves, and also best beautiful images. It's just, it is a fascinating and wonderful work. And I'd love to talk longer, but I'm now four minutes into the mandatory break and I'll, I'll, be, I'll get a slap on the wrist, you see. You will get a slap on the wrist. Well, you've been a great interviewer. I really, it's just wonderful to have someone who got it, you know, who really understood it. So well, thank you thank so much. You. Beth, I would like to talk again about other things and about, do you teach writing as well or not? Um, again, this is something because it's hard for me to, with the chronic fatigue, sort of, to, to, but I, I love it when I do. I do occasionally. Yeah. And yeah, um, yeah and um, yeah, I'm, let's talk again sometime. I think that would be so lovely. Much. Look, thank you and bless you and all the best to you. Thank you. Bye-bye, Beth. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I just think she's amazing, listeners. All right. Sorry, sponsors. I'm going to the community service and sponsorship announcements right now, and then there will be more here on your community radio station, 88.3 Southern FM, the sounds of Bayside. Don't go away. Stay with me more very soon. It's not just a home loan, personal loan, credit card or business.